Hello, my name is Brenda Salas. I'm the wellness coordinator for Montgomery College. I hold certifications from the American Council on Exercise, the Aerobics and Fitness Association of America, and the American College of Sports Medicine as a certified personal trainer, health educator, and wellness coach. I'm also a member of the Montgomery College Speakers Bureau and a presenter for the Commission for Women in Montgomery County. I've written numerous articles on health and fitness, and I'm here today to share with you there is a health crisis facing every state, city, and community in America today. This crisis is obesity. It is the fastest growing cause of disease and death in America. 300,000 Americans have died from illnesses related to being overweight or obese. The estimated cost of being overweight is at $117 billion annually. Obesity contributes to the number one cause of death for American men and women, heart disease. And excess weight has led to an increase in the number of people with type 2 diabetes. There are at least 17 million Americans with diabetes and another 16 million who have prediabetes. Each year, diabetes, which in 95% of the cases is preventable with healthy lifestyle choices, cost America $132 billion. It is well established that a healthy lifestyle, which includes exercising regularly, can prevent diabetes and reverse obesity and the health consequences of being obese. The challenge for many is finding the time to fit exercise into a busy schedule. In this program, we'll discuss easy ways to fit activities that improve health into your busy schedule. Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to talk about our busy, busy lifestyles and the consequence it's had on our health. Who in this room is busy? Okay, so it's universal. Um, we are extremely busy. Our work days are filled with things to do and um, while we have um, the convenience of modern day living that can help us be even more efficient, we're still spending so much of our day stuck in traffic, then seated at our desk, and by the time we get home, our, our at-home obligations consume a lot of our time too. And on top of it, we're extremely tired by the time we get home from the stress of the commute, the stress of the workday. So the idea of finding 60 minutes or 90 minutes a day to spend in the gym is just not reasonable for many, many people. People. So we're going to take a look at different ways that we can put in pockets of activity to help improve health. Now imagine that there's a pill that can do all sorts of wonderful things. It can uh, help to prevent cancer. It can prevent osteoporosis. Porosis. It can reverse osteopenia. It can change the cholesterol in your blood. Would you take that pill if it could do all of that and more? Yes, but there's a catch with this pill. With this pill you have to walk no cars allowed, 15 minutes to the pharmacy to get it, and walk back 15 minutes to get it. Would you still take that pill? Yes, yes you would. Well, guess what? There's no pill. It's the 15 minutes of walking one way and 15 minutes of walking back that gives you all of these fantastic benefits. The research completely supports this. The Surgeon General has recommended that all Americans get 30 minutes of activity each day, and we're going to talk about that. Now, even 30 minutes may be too much. Where are we going to find 30 precious minutes where we don't have something else that seems more compelling to do? Well, the good news is it does not have to be done in 30 minutes. It can be done in bouts of 10 minutes, as long as it's accumulated 30 minutes a day. Now, Hippocrates, known as the father of medicine, said, if we can give an individual the right amount of exercise, we have found the best way to health. So we now know what it is, 30 minutes a day of activity. If there really is a, a magic pill, why isn't everybody exercising? Well, let's look at some of the common obstacles to that. There's no time. That's universal. We're too busy. It's boring. I'm too tired. It's too hard, I'm too old, I don't have the money for the equipment, and the list goes on and on. These are very valid reasons for so many Americans today. And that could be because they have something called poor self efficacy around the idea of fitting exercise in. They believe that it's possible to lose 30 pounds in a week, as some network television shows present. Well, it isn't possible, and it's not healthy. Losing weight is a little bit like watching paint dry. 
Healthful weight loss is about two pounds a week. And they want to see, most people get into an exercise program because they want to see the physical res results rather than the not so obvious change in cholesterol, the not so obvious reduction in hypertension. These are things you cannot see, but these are things that are contributing to the devastating numbers that we're seeing of coronary heart disease, atherosclerosis, diabetes type 2, and cancers. So just a little bit of activity is going to help prevent all those, a better quality of life. Getting around these obstacles can be challenging. Tell me some of the things you do to get around obstacles to getting activity in your day. Uh, one of the things I try to do to get the obstacles out of the way, I just try to just dedicate um, a set time, even if it's shortening, shortening my lunch period. That's one thing I try to do, shortening my lunch period to allow me to do more activities to get my health, to get time in for my exercise. And that takes a, a huge commitment. So how do you maintain that commitment day after day or most days? <laughs> most days. Um, just as you stated, I just I know as I'm getting older and I see my health is declining, I, I want to be around for a little bit longer. Not too long, just a little bit longer. So it's just a constant reminder. You have to kind of motivate yourself to just want to be around a little bit longer and while you're around to be a little bit healthier. That's exactly right. And it, finding that compelling reason is important. I know that you have a new son who just turned a year old. So that becomes a very compelling reason for you to, to have a very good quality of life as he get, grows up and goes through college and then has his own children. Absolutely. Great. That's fantastic. So you found that compelling reason to stay motivated. And that's the challenge for many, many people. Yes. I also have found that you have to do it early. Um, if I put it off in the day, especially in the winter when it's going to be dark, um, it's not going to work. So if it occurs to you or you know you have to do it, do it rather than put it off because as the day goes on, more competing activities will come up. Two things I like to talk about that that's absolutely right. First of all, when it's done early in the day, if you've got the time to do it, then it's it's done. It, it's not hanging over you the rest of the day in those competing um, um, competition for your time doesn't come into it. But the other thing is finding the best time for you to do it and finding the best exercise for you. I'm often asked, what's the best activity for me? And my answer is the one you'll do. The same thing, when is the best time to exercise? When you'll do it. So you found for you that first thing in the morning works for you so that it's done and you can go about the rest of your day. Excellent. Uh, for me, it's it's a mindset where you have to have a heightened awareness, an acute awareness of opportunities to exercise rather than taking the easy path. So a, a very good example of that would be taking the stairs versus an elevator or not parking as close as you possibly can to the building, but parking a little farther away so that you have to walk that extra distance. So it's a constant awareness of opportunities to get in a little exercise. And that is exactly what this presentation is all about, those opportunities to move your body a little bit during the day. The little bit of moving your body during the, during the day can add up to a lot, and we are going to take a look at exactly that. Um, before we do, so there are some mindsets that come with getting into a quote-unquote exercise program that I, I hope I can dispel. Um, the all or none. We need to change that to some is good. If you think about setting a fitness resolution, many people say, I'm going to start on Monday. And then Monday happens and they sleep in or they wake up and not feel well or some obstacle presented itself and they go, fine, I'll do it next Monday. So we need to dispel this all or none thinking, some is good. Some movement most days of the week is so important for protecting health and improving health. Pessimism to realism, and this comes with the idea of self-efficacy around exercise. So many people have tried programs that simply were too much too soon, and they ended up feeling sore. They ended up not having a good time. Uh, they ended up dreading their workouts, so they drop out. It is the number one cause of dropout and the number one cause of injury. Too much too soon. So. Um, making sure that, that you're programming realistically. And people who've tried a really hard program or maybe a really extreme diet and have not been able to sustain the results because they couldn't continue, it was simply not realistic, then they walk around with fists on their forehead. 
loser around the idea of changing health. And that's their self-efficacy around that. So it's important to change that to optimism or to realism. A little bit goes a long way. I think it's also important to, to acknowledge and realize that it's going to take time. There's no shortcuts. That's very important. So there's a commitment that has to take place and just recognize it's going to take time. You're not going to instantly turn into an Olympic athlete. It just doesn't work that way. And that is really challenging for all of us, for humans, and we really <coughs> like the instant uh, gratification, do we not? We want to lose 10 pounds by next month when the college graduation occurs. And for most people, that is a very, very difficult thing to do. It takes a high level of commitment and motivation. And people simply are not able to continue working that hard. So the idea that I'm going to present today is little bouts of movement, we're not even going to call it exercise, can dramatically change health. So, the question that I ask many people is, how neat are you? NEAT stands for Non-Exercise Activity Thermogenesis. NEAT is a little bit easier to say. And what it means is how many calories, how much energy do you use in a day not exercise? Not exercising, it's non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Now, Back in the day, and this is going to make me sound really old, I grew up in a household where there was one phone, and the phone was attached to the kitchen wall, and I had two sisters. And if we were on the third floor and the phone rang, we even had a party line at one time, we'd have to run down and get to the phone first because there was no voicemail and there was no answering machine. Um, at that same time, there was only one television in the house, and there was no remote control. So every time we wanted to change the, cr the channel, we'd have to get up and walk across. If we came home from the grocery store and needed to put the car in the garage, there was no remote opener. We had to get out and physically open that. How much energy did I use in those activities of daily living? Those were activities of daily living. Those were not exercises. Any guesses? Much. much. I think it's much. Well, okay, what number would you say? You mean a percentage? Like no, give calories. me a calorie calories. number. I would say um, probably 200 to 200? 300. Okay. Anyone else? More than that. Is there a higher bid out there? 500. And a higher bid out there? Research says 1,000 to 1,200 calories each day doing non-exercise activity, just what is called, back then, the activities of daily living. Even when I was in college and typing my papers, typewriter, that required energy. Okay, so let's fast forward today. Do not touch my garage door remote opener. Do not take my cell phone from me, and I'm keeping my television remote. But there's a cost that I'm paying for all of this convenience. I am not burning 1,000 to 1,200 calories that I used to, and I didn't even know I was doing it. Now, put that on our tremendously long commute that we have in the Washington metropolitan area, and our longer than the average work day of 9.2 hours. We are not burning calories, even though we are busier than we've ever been in our life. So then, what are some small steps that we can do? Yes. Um, from what you described, what do you think the average um, calories for ADLs are now with all the modern conveniences? You said the 1,000 to 1,200 in the, in the older days. What do you think it is now? Research shows that we're actually in a negative. <laughs> we're actually like negative 200 calories uh, compared to what we used to do. So we're actually looking at finding a way to expend calories of about 1,400 a day, doing non-exercise. If we had the opportunity to do exercise, that would be great. But research further supports there may be, it may be better to get that activity during the day than one 60-minute spot may be better in terms of overall calorie burning, may not be better in terms of conditioning cardiorespiratory system, et cetera. So when we talk strictly about calorie burn, fitting it into our day, let's talk about what that is. Necessary labor, up to 100 to 150 hour, uh, calories per hour. So necessary labor is if I have to stable something, I put this stapler further away from my desk, so I have to stand up, go to it, and come back. I send my documents to a printer further away. 
I'm up and down out of my chair all day long. Necessary labor. I'm taking the stairs, not the elevator. Here I am taking the elevator. How many calories did I burn? 1.3. Here I am walking up a flight of stairs. How many calories did I burn? 35. I'd rather have the 35 than the 1.3. If I do that multiple times during the day, it adds up. And that's the point. It all adds up. When you're seated, are you calm? Are you a fidgeter? Be a fidgeter. You burn more energy. That translates to burning more calories. Um, and the activities of daily living. Learn to become or challenge yourself, as he said, to become inefficient, to find those opportunities for movement. So when you drive to the store, do you park the closest? Park as far away as you can. Always taking the stairs and not the elevators if the building is safe for you to do that. Let's come up with some other things that you could do as part of your day. Yes? I see a lot of people when they go to the grocery store, they wheel their cart all the way out to their car. One thing to do would be to drop the cart off at the front of the store, grab the bags, and carry them to the car. Absolutely right. So why don't people do that? Well, first of all, going to the grocery store is no picnic in itself. It's a necessary kind of thing that we have to do. But you're exactly right. That's a great opportunity. Any other opportunities you can think of and as part of your normal day? I'm thinking of housework. Okay, so <laughs> let's have a conversation about housework. Housework, we try well, to be as, can, uh, as efficient as we can, right? Sure. Let's be inefficient. Let's well, make three trips to, do, to put well, the laundry away. Well, doing the laundry. Away. I mean, I have to go downstairs to the basement and there you go. I guess I can do more loads and just have more walks up and down the stairs. Absolutely That's right. one possibility. Sure. Uh, for the pet lovers out there, I think how long a walk you take your dogs on is big. You know, I see a lot of people that it, it's, they view it as a necessary evil. They can't wait to get it over with. They take the dog up three houses and back, whereas if you allocate 20 minutes to take your dogs on a longer walk, you're obviously burning more calories. Absolutely true, and that's great for the dog, too, and Cheryl would like the microphone behind you. But for someone who's really restricted on their time to walk the dog, what can they do while they walk the dog and the dog is doing what the dog needs to do? Knee lifts, right? March in place, move around, do a squat. Who cares what the neighbors think, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, I was going to say for the parents and grandparents out there to um, just keeping up with your, your young ones and running around with them, exercising and playing with them gives you a lot of, uh, you're tired at the end of the day, but you're, yeah. you're burning a lot of calories. That's I a think. wonderful opportunity and it's fun. You don't yeah. even think about it yeah. as Absolutely. exercise. It's a fun thing to do and a great time to spend with your family. That's fantastic. Great, great ideas. Let's talk about some other tips for increasing the daily activity. So um, how many of you have worn a pedometer? What was your experience in, in wearing the pedometer? I actually liked it a lot. Um, and one of the things I was going to suggest, too, is I think you've got to have little benchmarks. I know I need encouragement. I need, it can't be open-ended because I have to know I'm doing something. So if I'm told I have to do 5,000 steps a day or 10,000 steps a day, it gives me something to shoot for and something to uh, structure. And so when I was able to achieve 5,000 steps or 10,000 steps, I thought I'd really accomplish something. Right. And if I'd done that, then I'd already invested that much, so I might as well keep doing it. There you go. Absolutely right. Did you find there was a little psychological game that you started playing with yourself by wearing the pedometer? Sort of competing Tr with yourself? Yeah, try and trying to take extra steps and yeah. trying to uh, get to the next 100. Exactly. Next Even getting milestone. those last 100 maybe in your bedroom as you just brush your Not teeth and march them. Not in the bedroom, but in other places in the house, making sure that you get those extra steps in. I've talked to people who in busy meetings, they decide to hold, hold the, conduct the entire meeting standing and moving around. So it seems ridiculous, but it's, it really absolutely can change health. All of this has been thoroughly researched. Mayo Clinic has a huge study on need activities. Um, in fact, they're known for that. And the difference that it can make 
in health, really quantifiable differences, and, and it's just so important. We are in a healthcare crisis. Uh, we have health reform that's being talked about, um, and it's simply that um, Americans are not moving enough. The challenge, again, is evergreen. We don't have the time. We don't have the resources. So knowing that just stepping in place can change your health gives you something to work with. I have another idea, too. Um, I talk to my sister and my mom every day, and normally I would just sit down and have a conversation and sit there. But now I try to stand and walk around, and it's, it accomplishes something more. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Um, so in talking about the pedometer, I do want to kind of put that into a, a framework for you. The average American takes how many steps a day? Any guesses? 3,000. 3,000 it is. 3,000 steps a day. So by tripling that, by going to 10,000 steps, we've seen some very quantifiable and remarkable health benefits. So just taking 10,000 steps in a, in a day, which equals five miles, changes things that we see in the blood, changes cholesterol, changes hormone, changes metabolism. Uh, it results in better health. So striving for the steps, if nothing else on a daily basis, can really, really improve your health. Linking quick exercises to your existing daily rituals. So when you turn the computer on, what are you doing? When you turn the computer on, what's your body doing? Sitting. Sitting, well, no more. <laughs> Maybe you're sitting and you're standing up. You're sitting and you're standing up, so you're doing square um, chair squats, or maybe you're moving in place, or maybe you're seated and you're doing a little abdominal crunches just while that computer boots up. Okay? Yes? It's just occurring to me as we were talking that these devices that seem to immobilize us, actually, they're mobile, and so actually we should be able to use them to be more mobile. In the past, you had to sit at a telephone and talk on the telephone. Now you can walk around with your telephone. You can walk around while you're texting people. You can walk around while you're listening to your iPod. All of the devices have actually freed us up to be able to move around a lot more, so why or not Or someone do that? like the elephant who in the circus is being trained and they're tied as a young elephant to a pole, and they learn that, but when they're released from the tether, they still stay by the pole. They don't realize. So you're exactly right. That is a beautiful point. And as Marty said, looking for those opportunities, and as Karen said, to move around because now we have those devices that allow us to do so, that we've gotten into the habit of thinking um, that we need to be chained to that device. So that's a wonderful, wonderful point. Any other ideas for linking some movement into your existing? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? Oh, you, okay, I think that's an opportunity for squats. Okay, then after that, you take a shower. So perhaps in the shower, you can do a leg lift or so. And after that, you're brushing your teeth. So maybe there's an opportunity for a sink push-up. And it does seem silly. And I'm so glad you're laughing at that. That's the idea. It's silly, it's playful, but the opportunities exist. And you will feel differently. You will have more energy. You'll sleep better. When we talk about sleep in this country, we know that we're having a huge sleep deficit. We're taking those devices into the bedroom with us as well. And they should not be there. And it's, it's uh, wreaking havoc with the quality of our sleep. And then the next day, we're tired. So the idea of getting to the gym is just not palatable. It's not attractive. However, putting those small movements in during the day can actually give you a better quality sleep. So again, keeping you out of the gym, that's what I'm doing here. Um, so let's take a look at some other exercise examples. When you're on the computer, you can set a timer. So every hour on the hour, it goes off and you're doing something. Perhaps you're doing some stretches, perhaps you're moving around, or you're doing abdominal crunches. So I'd like you to do abdominal crunches right now. You've been seated for a little too long. So simply take your belly button, draw it in, and do a spinal flexion, which is a forward bend, and then come back up. Beautiful. And again, drawing belly button in first, then rounding your spine. It's called spinal flexion. Great job. And one more time, pull your belly button in and round down. Now that pulling your belly button in is called abdominal compression. And if you could find ways to do that every day, that's going to do some interesting things for you. There's a lower abdominal muscle that we call the transverse abdominis, and it's a horizontal muscle. The only way to work it is by doing isometrics. And the benefit of working this muscle is it's your body's natural girdle. 80% of American adults 
have low back pain. A lot of it has to be with what is going on here and other portions of the core. So drawing your belly button in at every stoplight, at every stop sign throughout the day is going to help and strengthen that muscle, correct some anatomical deviations, and relieve back pain. Great, great, great. So when you're emailing your coworker, or I even know families where someone is in the kitchen and someone's in the basement and they call them. Okay, so how about taking those stairs or how about walking down the hall to go see your, your coworker? How about keeping a resistance tube in your office or a resistance band in your office and every once in a while picking it up and doing some bicep curls as you stand on it and doing some chest press with it behind your back. All kinds of little things that add up during the day. Let's talk about a stability ball, a big round ball. If you simply sat on that instead of a regular chair, you burn more calories. Why? Trying to stay on the ball. Trying to stay on the ball, the instability. Right now you're very, very stable, so your body does not have to work to keep you on the ball. Putting you on an unstable surface, a big round stability ball, automatically is going to cause some muscles to contract. When that happens, you're using energy. The other thing is you're working on your nervous system at the same time, working on something called proprioception, so it gives you a better sense of where your body is in space, and that's a good thing to do as well because we lose that if we don't use it. That also helps your core muscles, right? Absolutely right. And when we talk about the core, um, the core can be often thought of as just the abdominals, but it's not. It's 26 different muscles, from the shoulder girdle to the pelvis, that need to be worked. So using Stability Ball fires up most of those muscles. Where you are now, they're not working. Okay, let's do talk about sitting properly. We become habituated from sitting most of the day. The body is not meant to be in the position you're in now. The position you're in now is knee flexion, hip flexion, scapular protraction. Not good, the body's not meant for that. And in this position, you're actually not working very hard. If we put you in the position the body's meant to be in, depress your shoulder blades, squeeze your shoulder blades together, draw your belly button in, elongate your spine, you burn more calories just by changing how you sit. Now, the bonus of that is, how do you look? <laughs> Thinner, it's an illusion, but it works. Throughout the day, it's important to get out of this position, which is called hip flexion. That's no good. It's important to stand up and sit down many times during the day. The uh, benchmark, if you will, is three times an hour to stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. Very, very good for relieving the hip flexion that you're in, which causes a shift in the pelvis. And also, standing up turns on an enzyme in your body that has one job, burns fat. Simply standing up turns that enzyme on. So do as much as you can throughout the day by standing, and you will have higher levels of that enzyme, and you'll be more efficient at burning fat. Who knew it was so easy? Sitting on an exercise ball, we've talked about uh, doing push-ups on your floor or on the desk or on your bathroom sink, uh, doing crunches in your chair, doing those isometrics. So we talked about drawing the belly button in. At the same time, squeeze your gluteal muscles. Squeeze your gluteal muscles. Squeeze that derriere. Okay, now everyone's smiling. You like that. That's a very good thing. There's something that happens to us as we age, and the terminology, I think, is pretty funny. And it's very, um, has a good impact. It's called gluteal degradation. Do you want that? No. All right, so squeeze away throughout the day. Um, there's also another term that's just been coined this decade, the last decade. It was called um, chair butt, that the gluteal muscles come to conform to the chair. This is now a medical terminology. <laughs> I'm not making this up. So um, we're seeing a whole, now you're going to probably start observing general population, but we're seeing lots and lots of people where the gluteal muscle doesn't fire as it should because it is not being asked to work during the day. Okay, so exercises during your work day. Squats, seated ab curls, those abdominal compressions, standing bicep curls, 
standing hip abduction, if you simply take one leg away from the body and then the other, you're doing several things. You're working the muscle on the outer hip and thigh, and you're working muscles in your ankle that are in, responsible for balance. Um, when people get injured, a very common injury is an inversion ankle sprain because our ankle everters are very weak. Simply standing on one foot during the day uses more calories and strengthens those ankles. If you do abdominal compressions at the same time, you're burning calories. Am I sweating? No sweat necessary, but if I do this throughout the day as I'm talking on the phone, as I'm maybe sending an email, this adds up during the day. So what do you think so far? Do you like the plan? Yes. Yes. Uh, can I have Very a general good. question? Sure. Um, you've been talking about obesity, and obesity yes. is an epidemic, and we hear that, but I don't know what the definition of obesity is. That and, is a and great question. a lot term. of people would probably say, I'm not obese, and they may very well be obese. That is a beautiful point. Let's talk about that. When you hear the word obesity, what is conjured up for you? 300 pounds, okay. So there is a correlation. If someone is 300 pounds and not heavily muscled, they probably are obese. But the medical definition of obesity, and then we have criteria. Medical definition is the amount of body fat that leads to chronic diseases such as atherosclerotic coronary heart disease, diabetes 2, and cancers. Okay, now the criteria for that, because I do have clients who are 140 pounds and I have to tell them they're obese. The criteria is they have a BMI of 30 or greater. They have a waist girth as a male of 40 inches or greater and as a female 35 inches or greater. So weight, body weight, is not, doesn't necessarily convey fatness. We're looking at the amount of adipose tissue that leads to chronic disease. Yes? Well, doesn't that have to do with age as well? As we get older, something does occur to us. The, the uh, term is sarcopenia. It's Greek, and it means poverty of flesh. What that means is our lean tissue begins to atrophy. It's a natural part of aging that occurs after the age of 40. Along with that is something that was coined this um, in the past couple of decades, and that is creeping obesity, that every decade we are fatter. Okay. However, having said that, it still stands at the criteria is 40 inches or greater for a male, and why are we looking at abdominal girth as an indicator of obesity? When the fat settles. Okay, and the fat settling there, as it leads to chronic disease, what's the connection? how it affects our diet, uh, our, our ability to process food. Absolutely, all of that is tied in. So statistically, someone with a waist girth as male, 40 inches or greater, female, 35 inches or greater, statistically, they have higher rates of atherosclerosis, hypertension, coronary heart disease, and that's how that was linked up. You said BMI. How do we know what our body mass index is and how can we test it and find There's out? There's a calculation for BMI. BMI stands for body mass index. It's simply a look at the relationship between mass and height. For now, it's being used as um, criteria. It may not be used for much longer because it could take someone who is heavily muscled but not very tall, and label that individual as obese it's because it's simply looking at mass and not body composition. There's a third test that we can do, which is called, or assessment, which is called body composition, and we can do that numerous ways, hydrostatic way, skin fold caliper, to give us an idea of, of your body, regardless of weight and height, how much of your body by ratio is lean tissue and fat. And that's a better way to tell. I guess what I was wondering though is, is why it, it seems like those, your, your metrics or your thresholds for defining obesity are absolute numbers as opposed to taking into consideration the size of the person. So if a guy is 6'5", 280 pounds, they can be in great shape. They might have a 40 inch waist. Whereas if someone's 5'5", five, five, and weighs 140 pounds, but they have a 40-inch waist, that would, you know, obviously be, be obese. So I guess I'm struggling with that a little. Um, it, it's still the criteria that is being used by AMA, ACSM, so we're deferring to that. Um, we can do other measurements on these individuals. Again, doing body composition would be a way to um, kind of uh, 
balance that out, if you will. But body composition is not currently a criteria for, the, for defining someone as obesity. Currently it is BMI and waist girth. All right, yes. Just a, a little question, but are, are we bringing back recess for elementary school children? Well, there is a, a movement going on now called Let's Move Campaign. Michelle Obama introduced that last year, and it's quite robust and, and really vigorous, looking at bringing back opportunities for children to play, which we used to call recess. Uh, the challenge may be fitting that into a curriculum in a day, so finding other ways to get play in the classroom. Um, the movement is there. Certainly parents want it, certainly uh, teachers want that as well, but that's struggling with what the academic outco desired outcomes are too because so much is fit into that day along with budgets that are, can no longer support a PE program in schools. When I went to school, I'm dating myself, but there used to be president's councils on yeah. fitness and we used to have <clears throat> certain tests we had to do. And, yes. and it was, uh, we knew we had to exercise every day yeah. and there was a big movement for it. Has that all dried up? It has not dried up. The funding uh, for some schools to be able to implement that has dried up, but the programs still exist. Um, and so you, you can find those in the communities. Um, it's just a very complicated program, but the, the hope is on the horizon looking at bringing back play and bringing back, because this is called the um, the, the seated generation. We have children that ride a school bus to school, that sit in the classroom all day and then come home and they're seated play, doing their homework and then playing video games and watching television and playing on the computer. Um, so there needs to be some intervention. Um, parents do have a responsibility too, but parents are extremely busy. So you can understand the complications or how multi-layered this problem is. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk more about this idea of not necessarily having to exercise, but uh, just moving your body more. Taking a daily walk is a great way if that environment is conducive for you. Um, and it doesn't have to be done at 30 minutes. It can be done in 10 minute bouts. But there's an intensity that we're looking at. So when you're walking, you need to walk like you're in New York City. How do they walk? Pretty fast. With their heads That's, down. And with their heads down. But walking briskly is what you should be striving for. And if you're using your pedometer, that translates to 100 steps per minute. If you're using a treadmill, that translates to three to four miles per hour. So you put that speed on and there you go. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, great. If you can fit the 30 minutes in, fantastic. But your goal by the end of the day is 30 minutes of that accumulated intensity. What if you just decided that you would go out for lunch every day instead of having it brought into your desk and eating at your desk? Wouldn't that, just going out, picking it up, walking to the restaurant? Sure. If you factor in a couple of things, that you've parked further away from your office building, that you park further away from the restaurant when you go to pick it up, you're not doing drive through right? So you're putting in those extra steps, and maybe you're doing a couple of laps around the parking lot while you wait for your meal to be ready. So if you're in constant movement, absolutely. But any movement is better than no movement. And that's the idea of this, that health can be dramatically changed. Now, we're not saying that you're going to lose a tremendous amount of weight, but you're going to live longer. You're going to live longer. You're going to feel better moving. And that may then uh, transfer to being more active. Hopefully, this is a progressive kind of thing. Yes? There's a rise. Um nowadays in the um, onset of diabetes, even at an earlier age. Can you just talk a little bit about that and, and the adult onset type 2 diabetes as well? Certainly. Um, adult onset type 2 diabetes used to be called adult onset, but we do not call it that anymore. We call it non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus because children are developing it. It is purely related to lifestyle. 90 to 95 percent of the cases of diabetes type 2 are from lifestyle. When we look at that lifestyle, it's a myth somewhat that it's related to sugar intake. When we look at someone who eats a lot of sugar, we look at their lifestyle. By and large, they're eating highly processed foods, foods that are high in the glycemic index, that cause a quick insulin surge, that creates an insulin resistance, setting them up for prediabetes, eventually into diabetes if they don't 
uh, if there's not intervention. They are usually not an active when we look at sort of the, the demographics of demographics of those developing diabetes type 2, purely related to lifestyle. And unfortunately, we're seeing it much younger and much younger. Washington Post reported a few weeks ago that we're now seeing stroke as well because of hypertension. And, and these are all related. Diabetes type 2, hypertension, coronary heart disease, atherosclerosis, all come in a bundle together. It's not a nice present to get. It's not a nice thing to get, that whole bundle of things. Um, but we're seeing stroke now in individuals who are in their 20s, related to lifestyle. If someone exercises a lot and tries to watch their diet, can they still get uh, type 2 diabetes? Uh, certainly that can happen. There is a genetic component that could be there as well. Um, the benefit of living that kind of lifestyle is they've delayed the onset. They could have had it much sooner. And having diabetes can be, um, is extremely um, bad on all the organs. It affects every organ in the body, in particular the heart. So delaying that onset, despite having a really great lifestyle, is still a very good thing to do. Okay, so I want to go over the different components of a fitness program. I've been talking about NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. How NEAT are you? And that's kind of what I'd like you to ask yourself throughout the day, every day. How NEAT have I been? Even if you just move a little bit in place. Um, but if you decide to explore a fitness program, certainly, the more you do, the more the health benefits, right? So if you do it, um, decide to explore getting into a fitness program, we should talk about the components of a fitness program. We have cardiovascular endurance, that is the ability of the heart to work for a long time. We have muscular strength, which is the ability of muscles to perform, and muscle endurance, the ability of the muscles to work over time. We have flexibility, which does decline with a sedentary lifestyle and does decline with age. Um, it's important for feeling good when you move. If you feel good when you move, you're going to move more. And body composition is that idea of what is the ratio, how much body fat do you have on you. Cardiorespiratory or cardiovascular endurance is um, just moving for a longer period of time. So that's when you go to your Zumba class or you go swimming in your pool, in a pool. You go out for a longer walk than those 10 minutes bouts. Yes? Um, as far as the longer walk, this weekend my daughter wanted to go for take a long walk and I just didn't feel like it. She's like, come on, come on, come on. So we went and we went longer and further and we talked. And by the time we got home, it was about 45 minutes later and to think I wasn't even going to go. And I felt so much better. So I think if you have somebody to go with or to peer pressure, let's go tomorrow, you know, after dinner, whatever. It's yes. a good thing. When we look at why people, some people adhere to an exercise program and some people don't, we see some commonalities. Those who continue an exercise do it with someone. They have a workout buddy. They have a reason to do it. They're socializing. They're talking about the, the Grammys that were on television. Um, and there's another piece to this. Sometimes when you don't feel like it, just do it for 10 minutes and you might find you have a, a change of heart. Now, if you still feel after 10 minutes that this is not happening for me today, then give yourself permission to not continue with the exercise. But very often, that first 10 minutes, just doing it, is the biggest obstacle. Muscular strength and muscular endurance are really important for the ADLs, those activities of daily living. So I'm encouraging you to move your body more during the day in your activities of daily living. But if you don't have really good muscle strength and endurance, it's not going to feel good. So it's tied in together. Um, you want to be, as you age, someone who is vital and vigorous and able to take the groceries in and able to pick your grandchildren up. Yes? Okay, so just having mus muscular strength and endurance will allow you to live such a better quality of life. Now, metabolically, having good muscle strength and muscle endurance changes metabolism so that you become a more efficient fat-burning person. So you can keep that in mind, too. So there's a functional, and then there's a quality of life aspect to this. It also seems that, obviously, we're living longer as a population. And if we're, we're living 10 years longer than we used to 25, 30 years ago, you want that to be quality life, and if you don't 
work at it beforehand, those last, the extra years are not going to be nearly as enjoyable as they would be if you thought about it in advance. That's absolutely right, and, and we can put um, an economic perspective on this as well. So if you are, if we all are living longer as we are, sometimes with medical intervention, think of the cost of maintaining that life with necessary medical intervention, the different medications that we may be taking, etc. Um, so if we are someone who doesn't need as much medication and we are living longer, we save money. Uh, health insurance saves money and it's a win-win situation for everyone. I had the pleasure of meeting someone a few weeks ago. Um, she's actually faculty here at Montgomery College and she's 60 something and she said to me, I'm embarrassed when I get with my friends they're all on medication and I don't take anything. So I asked her about her life. She does not own a car. She walks everywhere. She's a vegetarian. So this may not work for everyone, but looking at someone who lives that kind of lifestyle and can say, I'm on no medication whatsoever in the sixth decade of life, in my health education uh, experience, that is so rare. And it was so wonderful and refreshing to see someone like that. It doesn't take being a vegetarian. It doesn't take not having a car. We can just put extra steps in our day and have those same kind of benefits. All right, so the thing to remember is motivation. We all want the magic fairy dust where we wake up and we're motivated. It doesn't happen that way. We're human beings. Motivation is a, is a very elusive thing. There are two kinds of motivation. One is extrinsic and one is intrinsic. And starting anything is generally from an extrinsic point of view. Um, so to be gentle with yourself when you're changing behavior. We all have an inherent immunity to change because changing behavior means we're giving up something that served a purpose for us. Not exercising did serve a purpose for us. It allowed us to not put one more thing on our plate in a very busy day. So making the reasons to change the behavior very compelling, doing your pro and con list. What are the pros of mo moving my body more? What are the cons of not moving my body more? What are the pros of changing my lifestyle? What are the cons? And, you know, exercise is really important. It's never going to be urgent unless we make it that way. So it is important to find a compelling reason to stay or stick with your exercise program. It's also important to reward yourself frequently for doing a good job. On the days when you take 10,000 steps, give yourself a reward. What would it be? Food. Food. <laughs> so we would have a conversation about what kind of food and how often that would happen. Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> and we could make a case for chocolate being good in the diet as well. So that idea of having some kind of almost, again, we want instant gratification gratification. So having that incentive that is immediate, that is right there, the carrot dangling to keep you going through this. How long does it take for a behavior to become a habit? A month. Wrong. The old saying was if you did it for 21 days it became a habit. A year. Three months at least, and this is based on new research that came out using groups, control groups and groups that did the behavior or not, and the consensus seems to be that you need to do a behavior for three months before it feels like a habit. We've been brushing our teeth for how long? We've been taking showers for how long? So it's a deeply ingrained habit. So the idea of moving your body more is not a deeply ingrained. But if you stick with it for three months, it will then be like brushing your teeth. I, I read a similar article, and it's three months average, but give or take, it varies a little bit based on the frequency within that period. In other words, the more often you do it within the three months, it may end up being two and a half or something less frequently could be four, but three's, three's an average. That's helpful. That seems to make sense. Sure, sure. Uh, the article that I read also said that if you skip a couple of days, it doesn't seem to set you back. That's good news because we're human. That is going to happen with our couple of days. Feel good that you're doing something good for yourself. Remember that nobody can move your body more for you. 
It's something each and every one of us has to take ownership of and has to do for better health. And think of the, co the cost savings. Uh, think of the quality of life improvement. Think about not becoming one of those 16 million adults with prediabetes. That's a compelling enough reason. Diabetes.org says that if we continue on this um, uh, statistic, if we continue how we're going, by the year 2045, 100% of us will have diabetes type 2. That's what this statistical model says. We need intervention now. And simply walking more in the day can do that. Um, what all successful long-term exercisers have in common is that they have a compelling reason to do it. They have a son that they want to be around for. They have a daughter that they want to share time with. Um, there's a specific class. I can never miss my Zumba class. They have the workout buddy. They have the personal trainer or the wellness coach who is keeping them accountable. They have a support system. They've chosen an activity that they enjoy. If they're not into running, running is not going to be the exercise that they're able to sustain. They enjoy what they do. They have a backup plan. Okay, my shoes are always in my car. If if that opportunity presents itself where I can take extra steps. Uh, and priority, it just becomes what you do. It becomes part of who you are. It becomes then intrinsic. And again, those ever important rewards occur regularly. As I said earlier, I'm goal oriented, so I need something to point to. So I've used motivators like a reunion, high school reunion. Um, or college reunion, or there's a party you're going to have to go to and people are going to see you, or I imagine a woman would say, I have a dress I want to buy or I want to be able to get into. So it's, it may seem uh, forced, but it, I come up with reasons why I have to get to a certain point at a certain time. Um, that is a, a really great point. When we talk about motivation and change in behavior, we need to have something that's called an approach goal. Not an avoidance goal. No chocolate for you until you go to the gym three times this week. Won't work. But rather, if you go to the gym three times this week, we're going to go to the store together and choose some exquisite chocolate for you. It becomes an approach goal. Psychologically, that diminishes any anxiety and becomes a reward. Now, one thing about putting goals into place is they need to be SMART goals. Um, I want to lose 100 pounds by June is pretty specific, it's pretty measurable. We can do an action plan around it. Is it realistic? So smart, specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time. So often our goals are not specific enough, I want to lose weight, or they're unrealistic, 100 pounds by June. So we have to look at the goals and make them realistic. Otherwise, we run the chance of reducing self-efficacy around goal setting and people go, I'm not setting goals anymore. I'm not setting resolutions anymore. Something I might add to that is that I think you have to incorporate, you have to incorporate some variety into your routine. If you do the same thing every time you work out sooner or later, I think your muscles it becomes a learned behavior and you're just not burning as many calories, you're not working as hard. So I think varying your workout uh, as, as much as you possibly can as well as those other things is probably more beneficial. Do you agree? Well, it depends on someone's goals. If the goal is simply to be more active, we want it to be interesting and attractive to do. Um, so maybe varying the walk going in different places. If we're talking about specific goals, then we may want to work in cross-training. But if the idea is simply to increase activity in a day, go walking in different areas. Appreciate the change of scenery. Walking in a mall to look at the stores. That's a way to change it up because we don't want boredom. If your only opportunity to get extra movement in your day because your day is so full is to do a treadmill in the basement in your house, then you change what you're viewing. A different television program, different music, something different to keep you um, engaged and excited about it. Okay, so where do you go from here?
<laughs> it's lunchtime. Well, sure, you can do that. And you may want to consider taking some steps to do that. Remember that a fit lifestyle is a progressive lifestyle. Um, remember that too much too soon is the number one cause of dropout. Remember that it takes just a little bit of movement in your day. Neat activities, non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, those activities of daily living. Let's think back to how it used to be. Let's become more inefficient with our bodies. Moving more, walking further to the printer, doing uh, household chores in multiples rather than taking all the laundry down at one time. So think about it. Get really creative. And I think you'll be really amazed and pleasantly surprised at all the different opportunities that you can find for different, for extra movement in the day. There are dozens of opportunities to engage in NEAT every day. And by doing so, you can burn up to 1,200 calories each day without exercising. Today's efficient lifestyle is a major factor in the obesity epidemic. Try being inefficient. Wash dishes by hand instead of using the dishwasher. Use the stairs instead of the elevator. Walk instead of driving for short trips. Park further from the building, stand rather than sit, and so on. You'll be healthier. In good health, I'm Brenda Salas, Wellness Coordinator, Montgomery College. Thank you all so much for coming. Do it, do it, do it.